Clouds have a powerful impact on climate and weather. But when it comes to understanding that impact, even the experts have more questions than answers. And those answers may be key to understanding global climate change and global warming. That's why scientists like Stefan Bormann are now taking to the skies. They're bringing new instruments with them, venturing above the Arctic to help unlock the secrets of clouds. You could say we're essentially going into the machine room of climate research. We're going into the objects themselves to study processes and measure the data. This icy mission is just one of many he'll be carrying out. many different kinds of clouds, even in this comparatively small segment of the sky. They've been captured by an automatic time-lapse camera on the roof of a building at the University of Mainz. Each type of cloud has a specific impact on the Earth's climate, and that's what scientists around the world are trying to figure out. Here in Mainz, our expert has focused on the impact of cirrus clouds. These high, wispy clouds made of ice crystals are one of the biggest challenges for meteorologist and climate scientist Stefan Bormann. Today he's preparing some experiments for a special day at the University of Mainz. His son Benjamin is also here, helping out. Not so dolle. The experiments are part of a lecture series called Saturday Morning Physics. It draws high school students and lay people from across the region. Today they're here to find out more about cloud research. Atmospheric physics is a broad-ranging field. It encompasses everything from the human impact on climate change to questions that seem simple on the surface. So why don't clouds in the sky fall down to earth? They fall down to earth, right? So why don't they fall down outside in the real atmosphere? Well, outdoors, there's wind. You have the updrafts and the turbulence keeps the clouds suspended in the air. That's why clouds don't fall from the sky. Showing how clouds respond to pressure in a small flask is fairly simple. But outside, other factors beyond wind and pressure play a role. Humidity, for example, and sunshine, or particles generated by human activity and climate-affecting gas emissions. It's a challenge even for the experts. But it's also why Stefan Bormann wants to interest as many people as possible in his research. Our current problems are nowhere near a solution. They're interesting problems, very complicated and complex, and they'll be crucial to our society's development. This generation will be profoundly affected by what happens in the next 30 years, so we're showing them what questions still need to be answered. Some of the questions can be answered in the laboratory. Natural processes are recreated here, for example, using a vertical wind tunnel. The setup here is one of a kind. Stefan Bormann can use it to simulate falling raindrops. When he changes the wind speed in the tube, the raindrops seem to dance right before his eyes. By suspending the raindrops and recording them using super slow motion cameras, Bormann discovered that the droplets oscillate inside the airstream, which allows them to pick up substances like pollutants from the surroundings. But laboratory work alone isn't enough to answer the big questions relating to climate change. We're at the Hohn Air Base in northern Germany.
technicians, pilots and scientists have gathered here to break new experimental ground. A cloud torpedo is being brought back from a test run. It was out chasing cirrus clouds. The tube was originally military technology. Normally it hangs from a long cable and is used for military target practice. But this one has been repurposed as a cloud chaser. The torpedo has been packed full of different kinds of sensors. The scientists are now going to check if the instruments carried out the measurements properly as the torpedo was pulled through the clouds. And the clouds presented the first problem. They were in Holland, Denmark and above the German mainland, just not in our area when we needed them. Cloud chasing is a familiar pastime here. The skies don't always cooperate, and the desired clouds can be elusive. But the team did finally encounter some clouds and obtain some data. And they're more than pleased. They have silhouettes of ice crystals from inside the clouds. They're magnified here on screen. On their very first test run, they've already obtained some good, usable data. And that's whetted their appetite for more. They're preparing for the next flight. And now they're finally ready for takeoff. This time, Stefan Bormann is on board. The weather forecast for the area over the North Sea is favorable. There should be plenty of cirrus clouds today. But getting to this point wasn't easy. Even obtaining the necessary permits from the authorities was a long process. But now everything's set. It doesn't take long to reach the North Sea. Soon they're passing over the North Sea Islands. Space and comfort are in short supply. Only the instruments fly first class here. Many of the devices operate automatically and need only monitoring. The goal is to take as many measurements and gather as much data as possible. Later, that data will be analysed. The first measurements over the past few days showed it works quite well. We need to practice looking out of the window to see which clouds we can sample and which we can't. And to work with the clouds. It's learning by doing. Sunlight passes through the thin cirrus clouds 12 kilometres above sea level. Together with other clouds, they help regulate how the sun's energy is distributed in the atmosphere. That has a significant impact on climate and weather. These radiation measurements will help illuminate the extent of that impact. And now it's time for the air toss. The cloud chaser is going to be released. Bormann consults with one of the pilots. The pilot wants to know how long the air toss takes to carry out a measurement. And that's surprisingly fast, just a few seconds. They'll head back into the clouds in 15 seconds. The goal is to capture as many particles as possible. Each cubic centimetre of air has only a relatively small number of particles, so they need a lot to come up with reliable statistics. The weather is doing its part today. They're able to fly a long stretch through icy clouds full of particles. Everything has come together. The weather, aircraft, instruments, having all the researchers healthy, getting it all can be tricky. And now it's time to bring the air toss back on board, very carefully. 
In the worst case, the air toss could detach. It's suspended by a very thin rope, about two millimeters thick, so we try to avoid sudden maneuvers. The rope doesn't break, and the instruments with their precious cargo of data are safe. Back in Mainz. The scientists are preparing for another big step in uncovering the mysteries of the clouds. This time, their research will take them to the polar region of Canada. Anyone who wants to take part needs to be physically fit. And they have to take part in a survival class. For Stefan Bormann, that means heading to the pool. This black tube in the inflatable can be used to gather rainwater. It's just one of the many things the participants are learning today about how to react in the event of an emergency. This training could be life-saving. That could be it. A small mistake, but a fatal one. They practice until they have it down, even though everyone here hopes they'll never need to use what they've learned today. And now they're on their way to Canada. And of course, they see plenty of clouds along the way. The journey takes many hours, crossing over Iceland, Greenland and parts of northern Canada. They have at least one overnight layover and change planes several times. Finally, they're almost at their destination. The last coniferous trees are below and then the tundra begins. They'll be carrying out measurements on flights inside the Arctic Circle, heading towards the Arctic Ocean. The starting point is at the edge of the vast Mackenzie Delta, where the river feeds into the ocean. It's not far from Inuvik, a town north of the Arctic Circle. Stefan Bormann had hoped to already be in the air, not on the road. They're having a relatively warm patch of weather this spring. The conditions aren't suited for taking measurements in the skies right now. About 3,000 people live in the town of Inuvik. The old traditions are dying out. Most of the people who still live here are here for the work. The big international companies are here, tapping into the region's gas and oil reserves, moving ever deeper into the Arctic region. Here on the airfield, the DC-3s are waiting. The DC-3 is a propeller aircraft, originally used in the 1930s and 40s. Even today, the aircraft are a legend. They're perfect for these research flights in the Arctic, rugged and easy to maintain. The Alfred Wegener Institute has two aircraft here, Polar 5 and Polar 6. They're one of a kind, flying laboratories. The two aircraft were converted, outfitted with modern engines and plenty of high-tech electronics. Polar 5 is specially equipped to carry out radiation measurements. It has electronic sensors that can gather data above the plane and below it, wherever the clouds may be. Polar 6 is specialised in tiny aerosol particles in the clouds. Underneath the wings, there are spots to attach numerous measuring instruments. Today is the first time that both of the aircraft are supposed to go up together. Stefan Bormann also has a first under his belt. It's a ground measurement station in a container. And it's located 160 kilometers to the north in a town called Tuktoyaktuk, or Tuk for short. The only way to get it there, though, was across the river when it was still frozen. And that almost didn't happen, as Bormann recalls. First, the aircraft was delayed because of the weather. They arrived two days ago. But the measurement container for Tuk is 10 days overdue. The ice road could shut any day. Three of our people are on location. 
If the ice road closes, the containers won't make it. It's nerve-wracking. Nichts für Leute mit schwachen Nerven, sowas. But the nerve-wracking wait was worth it. Just before the ice thawed, they managed it. The measurement container is in Tuk. It looks a bit lost here at the outer edge of Canadian civilization. Borman brought some members of his team to Canada. So Tuk's population is temporarily at a grand total of 872, two more than usual because Anja Roth and Paul Herens are here. Right now, the greatest impact of climate change is evident in the Arctic. Average air temperatures near the ground have already risen by two degrees Celsius. The measurements at the ground station are especially important. We don't have a lot of measurement data from the Arctic at the moment, so getting that data is quite interesting. And there aren't any big cities here, so the air composition is pristine. There's little impact from human-generated emissions. For example, soot particles generated by diesel engines aren't a major factor here. Having fewer variables makes it easier to analyze how much sunlight can penetrate the clouds. Professor Bormann was up here too and spent a few days checking things out here. We also communicate via Skype and email each other between Inovik and Tuk, between the ground station and the air station. So we exchange information back and forth. Inovik is where the aircraft and the Canadian Research Institute are based. There are daily briefings for the team where they discuss which aircraft will go up and with whom. The University of Leipzig also has a team here under André Ehrlich. He coordinates the operation and maintains an overview. The pilots are Canadian, the research team German. Seven different research organizations are taking part. Some of Germany's leading cloud researchers are here for various durations. Over a span of five weeks, they'll be carrying out measurements here in the Arctic. And we may be hanging around like the other day and flying, just getting off late. The, the big question right now is whether they'll get up in the air today. The pilots weigh in on the conditions. Today, only Polar 6 gets the green light under the leadership of Stefan Bormann. The second aircraft is grounded for the day. But there's no competition among the researchers. Here in the Arctic, they're all a team. There's the scientific aspect, the opportunity to do research on special clouds. We have some opportunities in Germany, but here the top researchers get a special challenge and special clouds. And we have a history together. We've been doing these measurements for more than 10 years now, and we love the Arctic. We like coming up to the far north. Even when it snows, we don't mind. They might not mind it, but the snow still has to be cleared off. This is a low-tech operation for a change. Now it's time to position the instruments. They'll be measuring the size and number of the particles in the clouds. The researchers are expecting a mix of water droplets and ice crystals. Here in the cold Arctic, ice crystals form in the clouds even at lower elevations. They'll also measure aerosols, the tiny particles in the air. They play an important role in cloud formation. From the technicians to the pilots to the researchers, they all have a job to do. It's a time-consuming process. Even the engines take a while to warm up. Then comes a surprise. 
The propeller turbines are switched off and everyone disembarks. A small passenger aircraft has reported engine trouble. It's making an emergency landing. The team on the ground are holding their breath. The aircraft manages the landing. The relief is palpable. The flight has been delayed by an hour and a half, but now Polar 6 is ready to go, heading north. They've soon passed over the strip of land and reached the coast. Now they're over the Arctic Ocean. The ice is already breaking up. Stefan Bormann consults with the pilots about the weather. They decide if they can carry out the measurements and where. Do you think we can sample this cloud or is the icing too dangerous? He's hoping to get as much data as possible. The main goal is obtaining precise measurements of solar and infrared thermal radiation, which are critical components in the climate system. We'll investigate their interplay with clouds, the open water in the Arctic, and the ice floating on the water. These are three complex factors, so we need precise measurements to better understand their effect on net radiation. This net radiation is crucial for developing climate models. That's the main issue. Existing climate models are not very accurate. Part of what's missing is understanding the effect of clouds. Solving the mystery of the clouds could transform climate models. That's what the scientists are trying to decipher. The team are outfitted in survival suits, courtesy of the Alfred Wegener Institute, which has carried out research in the Antarctic. With all the different technology and research institutes, coordinating it all is a major undertaking. Everyone has a speciality. The Alfred Wegener Institute provided the two aircraft, which was a big job. Other groups provided measurement instruments. Our team from Mainz brought the ground container, the ground station. That has instruments from Mainz, but also from Karlsruhe and Leipzig. In a moment, Polar 6 will fly over the ground station and its instruments. If the electricity goes out now, as it so often does, the trip will have been in vain. Anja Roth and Paul Herentz check the emergency generator. <laughs> then the research aircraft is overhead. It will crisscross the air above the ground station at various altitudes. That way they can compare the composition of the air as measured from above and below. It all goes smoothly. Now the aircraft heads out to a different measurement point, further out, over the Arctic Ocean. They do another few rounds, crisscrossing the area and taking measurements. This time they fly even lower. The last two levels are 1,500 feet and 1,000 feet. 1,000 feet, or about 300 meters. and they go even lower, to an altitude of 150 meters. After this pass across the ice and another catch of data, they can relax for the moment. Now it's time to head back. The beauty of the Arctic landscape lies beneath them. Now the expedition mascot, Caruso, the snow grouse, starts bobbing, signaling the landing. Today's mission is done. But it's just one of many. Over and over, they remove the instruments, read out the data, get instructions. And whenever they can, they go up again.
It's a huge effort and expense, and they want it to be worth it. At the end, it's quite an achievement. 31 starts, most of them with both aircraft, 16 days of air missions. Now it's time to pack up again. And before their departure, they survey the last daily logs. It was 105 flight hours in all, and some of them were rather tricky. The pilots and aircraft are flying at their limits, and sometimes it can get dangerous. For example, when the clouds get too icy, What they don't want is ice buildup on the wings and windshield. But it wouldn't be a real expedition if they weren't testing the limits in some way. And there's plenty of opportunity for that, chasing the clouds in the Arctic. The expedition up near the North Pole was a massive undertaking, but the work is far from over. Back at the research institutes, they have suitcase upon suitcase full of computer hard drives and other material. All that data has to be assessed, a process that can take years. Markus Klingebiel is part of the project. He's using the data in his dissertation. He now has a wealth of new information on cirrus clouds. But he can't say what that means for climate models. Not yet, at least. I've gathered a huge amount of data over the last three years of my doctorate. In the AirTOS campaign, we captured many shadow graph images of ice crystals. We'll use those to generate size distributions which tell us more about the size and number of particles at different cloud altitudes. We'll collaborate with various colleagues to better understand the impact of cirrus clouds on the Earth's radiation balance. So they'll spend years analyzing the data. And they'll gather even more data to arrive at predictions that are statistically significant. Here in Bormann's lab, they're working on the next step. His team is designing a lightweight and powerful measuring device for a very special mission. It's intended to go on board a Russian stratospheric aircraft called the Geophysica, where it will capture cloud particles at an altitude of 20 kilometers. You can see it when it takes off beneath the pilot seat, where there's a flap. Mm -hmm. Each piece of the puzzle brings the scientists one step closer to understanding the role that clouds play in the Earth's climate system. Which is why Stefan Bormann intends to go on chasing the mysteries of clouds.